Good morning, Chapel Hill, and welcome to your daily devotional. I'm Kathy Hurd, and I'm wanting to share some thoughts and some scriptures with you all. But first, I want to explain that I am by far not a Bible scholar. The things that, that I talk about are just um, things that I have run across in, in, in my devotion and um, things that you know, God says, hey, think about this for a little bit. So when I, I, the scripture that I quote will be, you know, straight from the Bible, but, you know, some of the, you know, events and stuff, I hope that, you know, I've tried to research and make sure they're in order. But anyway, um, I'm just, I'm just really, um, mm, I'm, I'm really glad to be able to do this, and I hope that you like it and get something out of it. So anyway, um, today we're going to be reading in the fifth chapter of the book of Matthew. And before we, we begin, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, here we are again uh, reaching out to you on a daily basis because we need you. We just ask that during this day, that uh, you make sure that we understand that you are there and you are listening and you and, and you are watching out for us. Just uh, pray that uh, through this devotional we can learn more about you and more about what you expect of us and that we have the grace to fulfill that. So in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Okay. The book of Matthew was written in his time to the Christian Jews. And you must realize that the, these Jewish people were under specific duress from moving from their strict Jewish beliefs into uh, a, a belief in Jesus. So Matthew was reaching out to them through his gospel to show the divinity of Jesus and to point out that he was the Messiah that was spoken about in the Old Testament. This book was also uh, written to show the disciples of Christ how he wanted them to live, disciples being us. And this is particularly evident in chapter 5. Remember that this was at the beginning of Jesus' public ministry. And it was following his baptism uh, by John the Baptist. And after Jesus spent 40 days and 40 nights in the desert, after showing Satan that he could not be tempted, uh, he began to round up his apostles, first Peter and Andrew, and then the son of Zebedee, the sons of thunder, James and John. And wouldn't you like to know what their dad thought as they, you know, dropped their nets and went on this little journey with Jesus? Well, Jesus performed his first miracle at the wedding at Canaan, and... He began his ministry of teaching and preaching the good news and performing miraculous healings of all kinds. Now, naturally, this caused quite a stir, and the news of Jesus began to spread, and large crowds began to follow him. Now, you, you, you must realize that the people that were following him were seekers. There were people in there that, that uh, were looking for a savior, and so they they were really looking to look, looking to learn, and then there was the curiosity seekers, where they are uh, they've heard about you know the miracles and the healings and things, and so they were along for the show. So this is the type of crowds that's coming along, along with uh, his apostles. Um, Matthew gives the account of one of these gatherings in chapter five verses 1 through 11 in the introduction uh, to the Sermon on the Mount. Now, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure of heart, 
for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. Blessed are they who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now you recognize these as the eight Beatitudes. The word Beatitude comes from the Latin word Beatus, which means intense happiness and blessing. Jesus presents these Beatitudes in a positive sense, showing us first an action and then the reward. They present the character of, of citizens of the kingdom. The first four Beatitudes reflect godly concerns, and the last four address concerns of earthly focuses. All of the Beatitudes promise us salvation. They also can bring peace in the midst of our trials and tribulations. But there are three of these Beatitudes that kind of make me think, really? For example, the first Beatitude says that the poor in spirit have the kingdom of heaven. Now to me, poor in spirit sounds like someone who's depressed. Um, have you ever tried to lift someone's spirit when they're really down? In this context, though, Jesus is meaning that the person is humble. Humility is realizing that all of your gifts and blessings come from God. To have the poverty of spirit means to be completely empty, spiritually bankrupt, and open to the Word of God. Someone who is humble accepts that they have a sinful nature, repents, and becomes a seeker. And then theirs is the kingdom of God. That is blessed. The second beatitude is worrisome. Blessed are they that mourn. How can mourning be a happy blessing, intense or otherwise? When I think of mourning, I think of loss, particularly the loss of a loved one. But in this message, Jesus, he is speaking of the loss of another kind. If we have truly become humble and credit God with all of our gifts and blessings, mourning and regret over our sins and the sins of the world press us down, we realize that we have hurt the one that has given so much good to us. When we realize how sinful human nature can be, we become really sad. We become mournful because we realize that we cannot be who we should be. The Apostle Paul shares his anxiety about this in Romans 7, 15 through 19. He says, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But I hate what I do. And if I do what I don't want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but the sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is my sin nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil that I do not want to do. This I keep doing. Well, I can certainly relate to that. You know, why can I not do what I know I should do, what I want to do, when I know it's good? sinful nature. Mourning in this beatitude is called a blessing because when we see the hurt we have caused by moving away from God, we want to improve ourselves and do what's right. The complete beatitude is, blessed are they who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And Jesus left behind the ultimate comforter, the Holy Spirit. And that is blessed. Well, skipping on down to the end of the Beatitudes, the final one really got my attention. 
Blessed are they who are persecuted. Now, I don't know about you, but for me, I try really, really hard not to make anybody even mad at me, let alone persecute me. Uh, now, remember the Beatitudes begin with references to things of God, the spiritual poverty, mourning our sins, meekness and hungering for, and thirsting for God's for God as well as, as then there's human concerns like mercy and purity and peacemaking. This last beatitude brings up the reality of persecution and insults. Jesus said many times in his ministry that those who follow him will be persecuted. If the, they persecute me, they will persecute you. And he said this in John 15, 20-21. The suffering that is blessed here is the suffering for righteousness sake, for being persecuted for doing God's will. Those who are persecuted for righteousness sake are living out God's ways in the midst of a world that does not respect God's ways and will reject them. This persecution has been prevalent since Jesus' time and continues today. We can read about it in the Bible. We can read about it in history books. And we hear about it in multimedia sources every single minute. In this beatitude, Jesus brings in the idea that insults and false statements regarding our faith is persecution too. Christians throughout the world still suffer the physical torment and execution that we don't have to bear and we wonder how they can withstand this persecution. But Christ's promise that the kingdom of heaven is ours makes it worth it. We endure hurtful and sometimes evil works because we receive this persecution. We receive this persecution and it shows us that we are identifying with Jesus and we are identified with him. We need to pray for those who confront much more horrifying actions than we can imagine, even to the point of dying for their beliefs. What an example of faith. Humbling, for sure, for the goodness that God has given us in our lives. But we need to face our persecution as well. Increasing attacks on the faithful show that we are on the right path. Also, it should make us wonder if we're not being persecuted. Complacency is not a sign of Christianity. All who are living a godly life will be persecuted. Paul is an example of the persecutor becoming the persecuted. And even though he lost all that he once held dear, he gained Christ and his righteousness. All of the Beatitudes give us comfort when we are following God's word that he will take care of us. In John 16, In this world you will have trouble, Jesus said, but take heart, I have overcome the world. We are part of God of the kingdom of God right now. God is using the people he calls, equips, and enables. God will bless the world through the people of the Beatitudes, people who are poor in spirit, who mourn, who are meek, who hunger and thirst, who are mer merciful, who are pure of heart, and are peacemakers, and yes, those who are persecuted. In verse 12 of Matthew chapter 5, Jesus consoles us by saying, Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For so men persecutes the prophets who were before you. That means that the prophets and the saints in heaven are like us here, and we are like them, and we will be in heaven with them if we follow God's word. And that is blessed. Dear Heavenly Father, Jesus warned us that following him was going to be a trial. 
we know that we will be on the cross with Jesus. He was there because of us. He came for us. And he showed us what he wanted us to do. What he wanted us to be. We ask during this time, this time of, of uncertainty and back and forth and right and wrong and badgering each other on what should and shouldn't be, that we stay strong in our conviction that Jesus is Lord and you as our creator have the plan. And the Holy Spirit is with us each and every day to provide the means for us to attain the promise of the Beatitudes. So in this time, we just praise you for what you are doing for us. We praise you for the, the courage and the conviction and the curiosity and the need to know you. And we just ask that you, you show your presence. Your Holy Spirit, lead us where we need to be that we have the courage to be your people and we have the ability to line up with the prophets. Bless all of, all of the people of Chapel Hill. We're soon gonna be back together. Protect us during this, this time that we stay healthy so that we can continue to be together. We just thank you and praise you in Jesus name because he told me that we could now I want to encourage you I'll give you a little homework my teacher side I'm not gonna put my, my teacher face though I want to encourage you to read all of Matthew's writing of the Sermon on the Mount in his chapters 5 through 7 it's amazing how much our Christian doctrine is right there. I love the last two verses in chapter seven. And so it was when Jesus ended these sayings that the people were astonished by his teaching for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Hope to see you soon.